How's it going? Good. Welcome to the NYU Game Center Lecture Series. Uh, we're very excited to have Zach Barth with us uh, tonight. And um, before I introduce him, I want to thank our sponsors, as always. Uh, Take Two, Fresh Planet. And Dots, thanks very much for helping support the, the lecture series and the whole event series here at the Game Center. Um, so Zach Barth is... Um, the purveyor of fine electronic entertainment at a company called Zactronics. And um, there's a story that I'd like to tell about Zach, uh, which I, if there are any of my students uh, in the crowd tonight, they may have heard this story before, which is um, that um, Zach created the game that was uh, cloned uh, to make Minecraft. Um, so as just a, you know many years ago, as, as an indie developer, um, he created this game and uh, Infiniminer, and uh, then uh, Notch came along and was a big fan of the game and, and kind of made a, made a copy of it. Um, and uh, and that, that went on to, to be uh, Minecraft. And um, I mean, just imagine, like put yourself in the shoes of being the person whose work was copied uh, to create, Minecraft, this, this multi-billion dollar uh, empire, this thing that went on to, to change the, the universe. Um, and, but the thing about uh, Zach Barth is that he, as far as I know, has never complained about it, never. Like, he, 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 he was never salty about it. Like, if it had happened to me, like, you could, like you could fill the oceans with the salt I would have generated <laughs> uh, based on this. Um, but instead, um, he, he, I, I just, he doesn't really talk about it. He doesn't complain about it. I ne never makes a big deal out of it. Um, and instead, he went on to make more games. He went on to make uh, games like Space Chem. The, 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 also, he made games that are like different, like, like in some ways very, very similar, uh, some of the underlying principles, but like radically different and also really idiosyncratic and personal and deep and challenging and hard and weird and incredibly popular. Like he made these games that you'd be like you're 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 surprised um, at at how uh, how he's managed to like find a passionate audience for games that are so uh, strange and interesting and and creative and original um, and weird and hard. His uh, it, to, to me it, it's it's in a, it's such an inspiration. Uh, such, it's, it's so admirable, um, and it's such a great example of what it really means to be a successful creative person in the world. Um, and it, whereas, uh, you know, Notch seems to have struggled to, to, to like, you know, make sense of his life and to continue being a productive person. And so, you know, the story I like to tell is that this, this is a, such a good example to look at, at, at how to be um, a successful uh, a game designer and, and a successful person in the world. It's, it's, uh, it, it's amazing. His, his most recent game, uh, Opus Magnum, is, is considered by many to be the resistance to peace of his career. It's a brilliant new game. Um, pause for laughter. Okay, now I'm going to go on. Um, and... Uh, uh, the uh, it it, it uh, his his games I think are um, each one of them is like a little uh, design lesson like an object lesson in game design we have so much to learn uh, from this this brilliant person and I'm extremely excited to have him here today please join me in welcoming Zach Barth. Thanks for that. Uh, we good? Oh yeah. That's all right. I was going to start presenting. That's <laughs> going to get very far. <laughs> Thanks. OK, so uh, I think most of tonight is going to be like an interview format, but I wanted to start by um, sort of showing off some of the games that I've made. Has anybody played a Zactronics game before? Cool. OK, there's going to be some deep shit in here that you've never seen before. Some of it intentionally that you've never seen it before. Uh, so this is a special version where I've added stuff that really, really doesn't help the narrative tonight of what I've done or how I've, where I've gone, but it makes it more embarrassing for me. So that'll hopefully be more fun for you guys. I'm just going to like blitz through this. Um, so I, I started making games when I was in college. Um, this is the first original game that I finished and shipped. 
before this, like in high school, I was messing around with like trying to program games, but it was like a clone of Snake and stuff that didn't matter. So this is Gregor Mendel's ProBotanist 2006, back when that was funny, which I guess it's not that funny anymore. Um, and it was, the, I, I mean, it's, it's not a good game, it's bad. This was made for a game jam where the theme was make a, make, design a game that your mother would play. I was the only person who entered, so I won. Um, <laughs> and uh, my mother what, didn't like it that much, but my now wife's mother did, so that's like pretty good. Um, the funny thing about this game is that it's, it's terrible, but it's kind of like the first Zactronics game because it's super mechanics-based. Um, you're trying to optimize uh, there's like weird mechanic system stuff you have to figure out, and it's really hard and not that good. Uh, the UI is terrible, which is a theme we're going to see a lot of in this presentation. Um, so that's that. Um, another game I made in college was a game called Infinifrag. And this is obviously the game that went on to inspire Infiniminer, which I made years later. Um, this is the game that sort of shows off the mechanic of like, what if the world was made out of blocks? In this case, there's no procedural terrain, it's just a flat plane because it was so poorly written that you could never actually build a world out of blocks. It's just like, there's 20 of them and that's all we can do. So um, I did not know how to use OpenGL then. So yeah, so this is sort of the, the predecessor to Infiniminer in and Minecraft, I guess. Uh, the funny thing about this game, and we can get into a little bit more later, is that this actually started off as a Oh god, like, like uh, there's a game called Natural Selection, which is like, it's a, a first person shooter for most players, but it's an RTS for a couple players who are like commanders. And so the original idea for Infinifrag was a game like that, where each team would have somebody who was like an art, playing an RTS game and was the commander, but they were building buildings and like stamping them down for the benefit of the rest of their team. And so the block mechanic in, Infinif in, in Infinifrag started off as like, what if you had like a five by five by five space where using like a purely 2D editor, you could, you know, build a building building and then just stamp it down. And like I was talking, workshopping this idea with a friend and he was like, oh, what if you put a block just by looking at it and shooting it there? I'm like, that is a great idea. So I didn't even make up that mechanic. My friend Keith did, but he works with me now at Zactronics too. So I still get the benefit of his smartness. Um, yeah, and that's the origins of Infinifrag. Um, so Manufactoid is a game that I made that also looks a little dodgy, uh, inspired by um, uh, the show, How did, How's It Made? How, how did this get, no, that's, no, okay, how, yeah, how, how it's made. And um, it is a, uh, you build a factory. And I, having watched this show a bunch, I thought it'd be great. Like, what if I could make a game where you built a factory? And this is the awesome thing that came out of that. Uh, it's terrible because the, the thing you can't see is that you have to open up like a Lua code window and write Lua. And it's just for like really dumb shit, like, like making it so that like when a sensor goes off, it pushes something. And like clearly in, in Finifactory showed that you do not need Lua code for that. but. This was sort of the first factory building game that, that, we, that I ever made. And, and believe it or not, this is the game that spawned all the ones that I made after it. Um, uh, Wreck Engineer is a game about reverse engineering electrical systems. Um, that's that. Uh, <laughs> uh, here's a little puzzle game I made that is, again, like taking, I, I went to, obviously, I, I went to college for like computer engineering and computer programming. And so this is a game that takes some of those ideas of like, kind of gates and you know the, the basics of digi building digital circuits and tries to turn it into a game. Terrible, but you know it's a beginning. Um, here's a game where you, it's not really worth explaining, I guess, but it, it's kind of a lot like Shenzhen IO. Like you build devices that map to things, and this is a thing that I like, I, that I like doing, I guess, is making puzzles where the puzzles are a thing you have to make. And there's like a little, I mean, I think we've really refined it like in Shenzhen IO, where there's a, each level is like a thing you have to make, and then there's a narrative surrounding it about like, why are you making that thing? And it's, uh, yeah, so that, this is kind of, you could see the origins of that. So the next one is something that no one has ever seen before outside of my circle of friends, which is a screenshot for an unfinished game called Infinifrag 2. So this is a game that uses the block engine, but it's bigger and has a procedurally generated block world with biomes. And so here you can see the swamp biome, and you can see like the hellscape biome beyond it. And um, yeah, so this is a thing that I started making, but we didn't really finish it, and it didn't really go anywhere. And it was an idea that I wouldn't revisit until years later with Infiniminer. Um, here's another thing that no one's ever seen before. Uh, I was really into virtual reality when I was in high school and college, but the unfortunate thing was that the rest of the world wasn't. So Palmer Lucky hadn't come along and like brought us the future yet. And, uh, and so I was, I was thinking about like, oh, how could I make VR when headsets still cost $10,000 and I don't have $10,000? And, and so this is sort of an artifact of that. Um, as you can see on the Barthian virtuality gradient, 
uh, there is somewhere in there uh, a category, this is really bad, um, but that corresponds to the idea of like, what if we make less stuff take place inside the computer and more stuff take place outside of the computer? So sort of like mixed reality, uh, which led to two projects. Uh, the Atropos, which was described as Karthik Bala of Vicarious Visions as a cardboard space shanty. Um, <laughs> It is a, a cardboard spaceship uh, that, that three people can sit inside and play a terrible game uh, that is live GM'd by me on the outside, imitating the voices of the characters you talk to so you can open up the comms and actually talk to them. Um, that won fifth place, which was, I think, just because they felt bad for us. Um, <laughs> And then the following year, we did a game called Tex-Mex, which was like a Kinect game before the Kinect. And we had, you can see the, the carpet there is, uh, has a screen door mesh in it. And so when you step on a section of it, it detects that you're standing there. And then he's holding a, a hacked Wiimote. This is when the Wii just came out. And so there was a whole thing about like hacking like the Bluetooth packets coming out of the Wiimote. And so uh, it's in like a little piece of metal so you can use it like a lightsaber. And then you, like, you're a giant Gundam fighting other robots. So this one first place, because they felt bad for us. So. Um, <laughs> And then finally, of all these crazy things, this is a game called Wreck Engineer 2, which is a sequel to the crappier looking version you saw before. This is the game that put Zactronics on the map. Uh, I sent it to Hackaday, which was a blog about like hacking electronics that I used to read, and they featured it when they didn't really feature games, so that was cool. And that sent a whole bunch of people my way and got a whole bunch of people that were interested in games about engineering to be looking at my website. And that's sort of what kicked off the modern era of Zactronics, uh, notably when I went to work at Microsoft. So uh, I, I did an internship when I was in college at a game studio. I was like, you know what? I don't need to make games. Like, There's no difference between programming games and programming productivity software. So I went to work at Microsoft. I I worked on Vizio on Office. I hated like every minute of it. Turns out there is a difference. Um, but it was probably better because honestly, I'm not like a good, I, I do program games now, but I don't really like it. Like there's, there's a, something better, which is design. And, and by, by being forced to not program games for a living, maybe that like created the space for me to you know, start making the games that got started getting better. Um, I started making Flash games because having people download stuff was a barrier to entry. And so here's my first Flash engineering game. Uh, you build steam-powered robots in an alternate history civil war, uh, which is a theme we would later revisit, and Ironclad Tactics. Um, this one is a steam-powered puzzle game kind of thing. It's not a good game. You shouldn't try to play it. But it's, it's interesting, I guess. Um, the Codex of Alchemical Engineering. Uh, this was an attempt to take that earlier factory programming game and make it not require Lua. And uh, you program little arms that pick up atoms, and anybody who's played Opus Magnum will realize that I'm a hack. And th this is like the original version, and then Opus Magnum is just me going back and remaking a Flash game that I made 10 years ago. But um, this was probably like my first actual popular game. It was on Congregate. Uh, it won like a Game of the Week award, so that was cool. Um, it was, yeah, that's that's that. Uh, it was also pretty bad, though, in retrospect. That when, when Opus Magnum came out, there were a bunch of people, or when we announced it, but it wasn't out yet, people were like, oh, should I go back and play uh, the Codex of Chemical Engineering? And I wanted to like respond to every one of them and be like, no, please don't. Like, You will not buy the new game if you think that. Um, here's a game called Constrictor, uh, which is about building integrated circuits um, in like, an alternate history where like the United States is communist or something. The story is told through three um, like TV guide snippets. I don't know what I was thinking, but that was before I had a writer helping me. Um, but it's a game about integrated circuits. Amusingly, this is the game that I get the most emails asking me to remake. I don't know. Um, I also made a game called Infiniminer, which is a procedurally generated uh, mining game inspired by the games I was playing at the time. So TF2, it's like a competitive like team-based deathmatch, which it turns out is not the way you make a game that people want to play. You've got to make it about punching trees. Um, and... Um, so, uh, in that, uh, Motherload, if anybody played the old Flash game by X-Gen Studios, Motherload, they went on to do Super, Super Motherload years later, that was like a huge inspiration. Which is funny because, like right there, like that game was all about like progression loops and like you go down and you like get metal and then you bring it back and you upgrade. And I saw it, I'm just like, digging is fun. Like I didn't know anything about like how to build like Skinner Box masterpieces. So, yeah. Um, this is a fun one. So, uh, before I made any commercial games, when I was at Microsoft, I really wanted to open up a laser tag arena, which I was going to call the Awesomeplex. And I was really serious about this, I guess. Everybody in my life was like, oh, that's a weird idea. But like, we were going to do it. Like, this is a picture from me in high school with like, some laser. I was really into laser tag, or the idea of that. I don't know. Um, I didn't do that. And, um, but there is a joke in Shenzhen IO about somebody opening up something called the Awesomeplex. Uh, instead of opening up the Awesomeplex, I made Space Chem, which was a much better idea. Um, and that was definitely, that was the first game that I sold. Um, there were a bunch of people working on it. We made enough money that we could start a game studio. Um, so this was a good decision, I guess. 
So in 2011, I left Microsoft. I started a, a small, we had like a 100 square foot office with like me and like two other people crammed in it with no windows. That was exciting. Um, we started working on not this game, but another game that, called Miniatures that I don't even have anything to show for it. Um, but we ended up, after that didn't really go anywhere, making a game that was Ironclad Tactics. And this was, oh god, okay, so this is like the, we, we, we tried to make a sequel to that steam-powered game I showed you before, and then somehow we ended up making like a card-based tactics game. This is in the list of games that you wanted to talk about. This was suspiciously absent. <laughs> but this is actually like the, this is like the weird like black sheep of like the Zaktronics family. Um, it definitely, we thought it was going to do really well. It didn't do really well. Um, we thought that if Space Chem made X amount of money, then surely this game would have to make more than X amount of money, and it didn't. And um, this, this sort of, uh, we worked on it for two years. We worked on some other like contract work while we were doing it, so that's why we didn't go out of business. But the returns were way lower than we thought. We had to like have the team, uh, and that was what really like made us think like, okay, we can't merely make a game. Like Space Chem was, I just, we just made a, you know, I, I just kind of said, we're gonna make this game, and some people followed me, and that was cool. And uh, with Ironclad Tactics, we're like, we can just make anything. It's 2013, you can make any indie game and people will buy it, and then that didn't happen. And uh, that really forced us to kind of rethink what we were going to do if we wanted to survive. Um, the thing that kept us alive during Ironclad Tactics were some educational games that we made for Amplify. Does anybody about know about like the Amplify educational yeah. games thing? Yeah. So that was a thing. Um, we made three games for it. They paid us like too much money, I guess, for, for these games. Um, this is a game about starch metabolism, where you like flick the different molecules around. It's really weird. No, you can't play it. You cannot play this game, I don't think, if you want to. Maybe you can now. I don't know. Here's Have a Tactics, which is a, a match three game. It's kind of like triple town but like you eat other things and then like eat rabbits eat their own poop is like a wild card mechanic it turns out that making games that have pooping in it is hilarious uh, kids love it um, and then we made a game about factoring like numbers where you fly around in a spaceship and like slice through them to factor them it's pretty cool um, we also made a game called Infinifactory. So this was after we sort of like had to cut back and rethink what we were doing. We're like, okay, you know what? We're gonna make a game that's like Space Chem. People like Space Chem. Um, and I guess in, in retrospect, this is funny now because all the games we make are like Space Chem. Uh, we've kind of focused in on that. I guess when you, you, you find something you can do, you do it. Um, Infinifactory is basically going back to the blocks of Infiniminer and then kind of adding in like the space chem, you know, like building a factory mechanics. Um, this is a game that for a long time I wanted to make, but I thought I couldn't. Like we were talking about the Minecraft thing, that after that happened, I, I sort of felt like, oh, I, I can't go back to like make a game about blocks. Like that's, that ship has sailed, like it's kind of hacky. Like, and I was like, wait a second, you know, I can. I like, no one, you know, like if anybody can make a game with blocks in it, I can. And so we made Infinifactory and it did okay. Um, also made a game called TIS-100, which is inexplicably about assembly language programming, where instead of a tutorial, there's a 14-page manual. And it did really well. We almost didn't sell this, oh god, we almost stopped working on it like three times. And it was, it was like, whatever, we'll just finish, we'll ship it, you know, we'll see what happens. It did really well. It's weird. I don't get it. Weirdly, another, like the human resource machine, another assembly programming game came out the same year. I don't, it was, that was weird. Um, uh, and then I went to work at Valve for a year. Um, Possibly I was afraid of missing out on the VR train. I don't really, I, we didn't really make any games during that time. Um, but then I stopped working at Valve and uh, we sold Zaktronics to a company here in New York City um, who distributes games in boxes at Walmarts and um, and we, they bought us and we started working on some new games and that's how we've been doing business since. Um, so this is Shenzhen IO, which uh, we thought, you know, if, if a game about assembly did well, let's make a better game about assembly. And so, you know, 14 page manual, that's too short. Let's have a 40 page manual. Um, and so that's this game. And this game did exceedingly well. And it's weird. I don't get it. It's a, you, you program ships and you build circuits and it takes place in Shenzhen, which is an actual city uh, where they actually make electronics. Um, uh, and then we made a game called Opus Magnum where you build, uh, you know, again, just going back to Codex, but remaking it and, uh, and getting away with it. Um, it's an okay game, I guess. Um, and that is the end of that. So, um, yeah, okay, so that's, that's, that's all our games. So now when we talk about them, you will know what I am talking about. Um, let me see, I have some pictures, but um, uh, we'll do the, the old screenshots really quickly, because okay, I don't know how those are gonna fit in. Yeah, so, so here's a really old screenshot of Space Chem. <laughs> and <laughs> these are funny because it's, it's all me cobbling together art. Um, but one of the funny things is that we like ship, we straight up shipped some of this art, right? Like the symbols there, our, our artist never made anything that I was satisfied with, so we shipped our placeholder art. Um, but we didn't ship like the, the crab. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so that's that's what space. This, so this is the kind of our, our way that this is my style of making games is that I make like terrible pixel placeholder art, and then we use that. But that like allows us to totally mock up the game. We sort of make games like in one big blast where like some people iterate and prototype. We're just like I'm like okay, we're gonna make this game, and then so we just try to make that game. And it turns out if you keep your development cycle short enough, you can get away with that as long as like not too many of them fail. I guess I don't know. I, I prefer like Shenzhen IO. We spent four months from starting working on it to releasing it on Steam, and then we spent an extra two months in early access, and then we were done, and then we moved on. And it's like that's great. You can do anything when you make games that quickly. Um, so here's a really early mock-up of Space Chem. This is like I don't know. It doesn't look anything like Space Chem. It also has like a whole financial simulation that definitely didn't make it into the game. Um, uh, here's a, an early mock-up of TIS 100. Um, this is when it was originally a mini game in a big engineering game that we were planning as like a side project called the Second Golden Age, and we we totally stopped working on that. But this was a fun idea, and then it turned into a whole game. So that's kind of fun. Um, and then this <laughs> this is uh, the screenshot of the game that inspired uh, Minecraft inexplicably. So this is like that top-down view of like somebody playing an RTS game where they're like building buildings for their people in you know, like in a block world, except like it looks nothing like it, right? And so that's somehow a prototype. It almost looks more like a programming game. Um, yeah, so those are weird contextless screenshots. Woo. We can talk yeah. about stuff, yeah. Okay. Uh, let me grab a couple of chairs. And uh, there's a mic right behind the screen right there. You grab yours. Okay. I'll grab this one. Um, Do you want to turn off the projectors? Uh, yeah. Are there is there anything else that you want to show? No, it's just the. the, the yeah. Okay. So good. So then, there. yeah. Let's let's go ahead and, and we'll turn off the projector. Thank you. Um, Do you need the microphone? Oh yeah. No, I'm just, I'm just gonna <laughs> shout. You all can hear me, right? I have a very loud voice. Um, I was hoping we could just yell. Uh, is this on? Does this work? Oh yes, there we go. Does, does this work? Um, is it working? Yeah, I think it is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Hello. Hi, Hi, Zach. How are you? Good. Um, so, ah, look at that. Uh, why Infina? What's the Infina oh, okay. prefix come so, from? So that was a whole. Um, how would you like a franchise? Yeah. Franchise makes it sound legitimate, which it wasn't. It was yeah. a bunch of game experiments that I did while I was in college. Yeah. So there was Infinifrag, which you saw, mm -hmm. which is the first-person shooter thing that ended up being. There's um, Intelligent. Dis Destruction, which was a game, it's like a, an art, it's like a terrible strategy game where you get to build your units as you play, so you design them. This is a thing that actually commercial game companies do sometimes, and they're always terrible. Like an RTS where you can build your own units. Right. And but like you could parameterize and like draw some like terrible pixel art for stuff. There's yeah. that. Um, there was um, the, the whole idea was they were games where you created the content for them as part of playing it. Okay. There was one that was like a board game that did kind of like a similar. Th they were all bad. Right. That's why you've never heard of any of them. Yeah. Um, the, uh, how how big is your team now? How what's the size of the of the crew at so we, Zectronics? We are five full time people currently. Really? That's yeah. okay. That's great. And uh, are you the main programmer? No, that's Keith, the okay, guy so who Keith invented is, the the shooting pointing blocks and, and doing that thing. Um, so you, are you writing code ever yeah. on on projects? Okay, yeah. but not not, not the, the main, critical not the stuff. Heavy lifting. Yeah, and. Um, Tell me a little bit about the art process. One of the things that I'm, I'm really impressed with uh, Opus Magnum is the, the just the visual design and the art. I find it like really, really subtle and beautiful. So what's the story yeah. behind that? So we have, I mean, I guess that's our artist, right? So yeah. we, have, we have an artist, Kyle, who's been working with us since Ironclad Tactics. Okay. And so if you saw in the Ironclad Tactics screenshot, the um, there's a lot of like tooled metal. I actually, we were at the Met today and I sent him a screenshot of like, or no, not a screenshot, a photo. <laughs> I sent him a photograph of a real, of screenshot of a real, real life, life screenshot yeah. of the, the suits of armor because yeah. they they have like this really intense like tooled metal and there's like, they're, they're stained so you can see the detail. And like, that's how he builds UI art is that he, he does everything like with like, by painting it like in Photoshop. And we end up with these like obscenely detailed UIs. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that uh, Opus Magnum is kind of just like the natural evolution of that yeah. with like oh. lighting effects, like really hard fought lighting effects. It's all a 2D game. And then like, which means we have to do like weird shader stuff for like 100% of our lighting. Yeah. And Keith hated it, but he did a good job. Oh yeah. So, uh, <laughs> the result is, I think, really stunning. There's yeah. something 
something really nice about this world, which is made up of uh, things that are like symbolic units and everything's yeah. abstract, but there's a little, there's such a concrete texture yeah. to everything. I think yeah. it turned out really, really yeah. good. That's, that's all Kyle. And, and so you made fun of yourself in terms of interface design, but actually your you, usability is pretty good in your yeah, games. I think, so is we, that you? Are you the yeah. person so, in charge of that? I, I, I mean, I guess like other people like call me out when it sucks. Yeah. So it's like a team thing, but that's yeah. like my I, I'm supposed to make it not suck. Um, so Kyle's good too because he's he's interested in UI, so he helps out with that. But I mean, like I, I'm the one who's been making these games sort of like for the last 12 years, and so it's been a constant push to like how can we make this suck less? How can we make this suck less? Uh, and just trying over and over and over again to make it suck less. <laughs> and, and is the um, is there a process by do you start with like do you draw like schematics and you did that on pencil yeah. and paper yeah. and then you're looking at that and then do you like do like tighter versions of that in illustrator or what's what's your process for getting the interface right so I'll probably start drawing it on paper I, I yeah. do most things on paper for actually like getting the idea out there um, I'm not an artist so when it comes like I can't really express myself like in art software that well um, but so I'll start on paper and then I'll go into Photoshop and make those like terrible pixel mark mock-ups and then we'll just kind of throw them in game and start like integrating that yeah. and try to get as much of the game so like well I'll make those screenshots or like the the mock-ups and then we'll sort of like like Keith and I will start like for a contemporary electronic theme Keith and I will start building the game and like white boxing the whole thing and then, uh, like Kyle, will just we'll just set him loose. Now we have another artist too. We'll set him loose to try to like create like real versions of that art, and like they'll kind of like push back and like move stuff around to make it look better or make it like work better. Mm -hmm. And then like we'll kind of push back on that, and eventually it'll like converge in the game with yeah. like shippable art. <laughs> yeah. And um, and what about the puzzle design? Like where like what's the 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 process flow for that. This is where we have to turn the projector back on. Oh, really? I yeah. yeah, I didn't think we'd, I thought, I thought it'd take okay. longer to get is to this that, part. Is that possible? Yeah. I apologize. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> this will be the last it time, take, though. It may take a minute to warm yeah. up. Yeah, uh, well, I'll open this up. Anything, be great yeah. Sure. yeah, so, let me open this up really quickly. I'm going to find a good screenshot. So I don't know how many other designers do this, but my my thing for designing puzzles, we've done four, five puzzle games so far. And for every single one of them, the way I design puzzles is that I'll make a worksheet, like I'll go into like a, like a graphics program and make like a worksheet of what a puzzle should look like for this game. And then I'll print out like 50 of them and then design like 50 puzzles on this worksheet. So, I also like so doing do taxes mean, for the, the what, same reason. What, when you say worksheet, what do you mean? You can see. So okay. uh, like a Shenzhen I.O. puzzle, there has to be a board layout. There has to be a name. There has to be, oh, I can look at this one. Uh, there has to be like a, a bunch of timing diagrams. And so I made like the, the stuff that's not hand drawn is like the, it's sort of like the schema. Uh, if, okay. To use like programming term, it's like the schema of a puzzle. And then I just fill it out. And if the sheet is filled out, like it's a puzzle. Okay. And so um, I do this like religiously for all of my games and like I'll just have like a huge stack that I'm carrying around with me all the time and then uh, like I can like, the, the cool thing about paper is that if you want to like put them into an order and work on the progression, you can like tack them up on the wall and then you can just kind of look at all of them at once and then you can spot the one that sucks and you can take it down or move them around and do stuff like that. Like real life has a way higher of like a DPI than a screen. Okay. And so and, like manipulating stuff in real life is, is preferable, right? Huh. I mean like, you, if, is if this- Is Brett Victor here? Brett Victor is here? tonight, maybe? He said he might drop by. Because this sounds very much like it, we were talking earlier yeah. about about his idea of dy Dynamic Land, which is about embodied yeah. uh, software development. And what you're describing is very much like that. It's like an you, offline version so, of that. Yeah. yeah, so you have like, uh, these things are, are posted up on the wall. And talk us through this. So go oh, yeah. back to this one for a second. So this is for Shenzhen IO. Oh, so yeah, I'm this is as, a good puzzle. So I'm, this, not, I'm not that familiar with Shenzhen IO. So break this down for us. So like, this what's puzzle is, we, we should start with the story, right? So the way we actually start designing puzzles, this is like the second story. Step. The first step now is that I sit down with our writer, or I tell him to sit down, and I say, come up with 50 ideas for puzzles, <laughs> but like purely from a narrative standpoint, really? right? Okay. Because he's writing the story, and so he knows like what kind of things ought to occur. And like usually the story brains, like the, the, the thing that is the story started with a brainstorming session between me and him about like what the world is like and what kind of stuff is in that world. And, and then he starts writing, and then he come, or he, he starts writing while coming up with these ideas. And so like, I guess the, the list of puzzle ideas, I guess, comes first because then he's going to write the story to that and then I'm going to design all those puzzles and then they kind of meet back up again. And so, like, uh, one of the ideas that we came up with in advance for Shinjin I.O. is that there's a musician called Cool Dad. 
and everybody hates him, but he's really popular. And so we were trying to think, like, it takes place in the future, so it's some sort of, like, future music genre that we don't really know what it is, and he's, like, 40, and he, like, sucks. And so how do you show that he sucks and is 40? And the answer is that the thing you're making for them is a million remote-control color-changing vape pens. <laughs> I apologize if anyone in the audience vapes, but, uh, but yeah, so we picture at a Cool Dad concert, everybody's got their vape pens that they were handed out, and they're all vaping, like, in the whole audience, and then just the room is filled with smoke, but then all their, their pens are changing lights based to the music, and so it's, like, lighting up the whole thing, so it's sounds kind of awesome. beautiful. I thought you said this guy was bad. This sounds awesome. Exactly, and that's the, that's the paradox of Cool Dad. Yeah. And so the way that we bring it out is, you know, like, we tell it through the story, we have, like, a joke, you see that it, it actually turns out that before his concert, Cool Dad gets busted for going into Japan with methamphetamines okay. in his bags, and so the it's concert like gets Paul called McCartney off. Reference. And then, oh, yeah. uh, is it? Yeah, yeah that oh. wasn't a deliberate Paul McCartney reference? Yeah, he got, he got I didn't arrested, write the story. Uh, he got arrested uh, flying into Tokyo, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, maybe it is. Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> yeah, this is, yeah, that's the great thing about working with people is they can slip stuff past yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. So we've, I've got a fun story about that. We'll come back to that okay. later. So... Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so, like, we came up with this idea for the puzzle, and uh, it's perfect because it tells the story about the world, and it also, um, like, it also is a product that you can build, which is what Shenzhen I.O. is all about. So, if you look on the top, uh, can you guys see my mouse cursor okay? Uh, yeah. yeah it, so, is it possible to make this full screen somehow? Oh, God, probably. The magic way you work at Microsoft. <laughs> figure it out. Full screen mode. One, yeah, there you go. Okay, so um, obviously the name of the puzzle is just for my sake. Um, Remote control, color changing bait. Right? Yeah, exactly. And so here's like the circuit board layout because Shinjin IO, like in Shinjin IO, I guess the thing that people love, hate about it but also like about it is that you have a, a board and it has to fit on the board. Yeah. You're not allowed to have more space. And that was one of the reasons why in Opus Magnum you can have an infinite board space. Yeah. And a lot of people complained about the fixed board. And like the fixed board is appropriate for um, like building circuit boards but not for magicians so, or wizards or whatever, <laughs> alchemists, whatever. So, um, so there's a fixed board layout, and then we have an input, which is the color, um, like data about the color from like the thing that's broadcasting it, and then you have an RGB LED, which is your output. And so down here, you can see uh, the names of the signals, <coughs> the, um, the, the types of signals, that uh, color coming in is XBus, which is like data, so it's a data input, and then we have digital IO outputs, and then you can see that like a packet comes in of like 0 to 4, and then you have to start pulse width modulating like the, um, the output signals to match that. There's also like, there, there would be like written text, I guess that's what the, the notes over here are like shorthand for myself that would eventually like help me remember what the hell this puzzle's about. And, and then, th is this the solution? It's not the solution, it, this is, so in, have you played Shenzhen IO? Uh, no. Okay, so in Shenzhen I.O., um, the, uh, there's a, you're shown waveforms, so yeah. they're input and output. So the inputs are going to happen, and the outputs are what you have to generate in response to those inputs. Okay. So it's like electronics. Yeah. And so it's sort of like, an, like, like it's, uh, I guess technically, from like a technical standpoint, it's, it's test-driven design, but for the world of electronics. That somebody comes up with a spec that says, in, under these circumstances, it should do this, and they hand it to you, and then you implement it. Okay. So like, that's a real programming thing, like test-driven design. Right. And so you don't see it a lot in games. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so like this is a puzzle for that game, and it kind of encapsulates all the stuff. Cool. So yeah, so it turns out Cool Dad was framed. It was his his twin DJ rivals, DJ like and DJ subscribe. They framed him by planting the amphetamines. So he was vindicated later, and he got to do the concert, and they got to they didn't get saddled with a million color changing vape pens. It's a happy story. Do you? Um, <laughs> Uh, are there more of these that you... Oh, there are a lot us? more. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, the, show us, take us through. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, they kind of all look the same. Um, they're like small multiples. They're better in aggregate, right? But I can't blow them up because we're on a goddamn computer screen. If they were on the wall, yeah. you could see them all. Yeah. Um, here's like the patriotic sandwich assembly robot. This is an example of one that has a little picture-in-picture -picture display of like the patriotic sandwich maker. Okay. It, it makes a sandwich that Americans will love and then pops up a little American flag because Americans love it. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, and then these are notes on the puzzles? That yeah. one said some ideas evolve and change, but this one was oh, yeah. bold so from the start. I, yeah, I, I scanned these, and then I add like I, I wrote notes to like the... How many of these are there? Just like hundreds? Well, like, so this game has like 50, or I, there's probably okay. like 40. There's okay. one for every puzzle. And, right? you do, and this is your process for every game? Yeah. And have you always done this? From the beginning? I mean, since, since Space Camp. Since Space Camp. I, I needed okay, a way wow. to organize. I, I think was, Space Camp was where it started. I, uh, I started draw, trying to like mock these up in like Visio because I worked on Visio. Yeah. And it was just really inconvenient. And I'm like, God, com diagramming on a computer kind of sucks. So I made a form. And like I said, like this is when I also started a business. So I was getting into doing taxes. Yeah. And like I, it's really sad. Okay, maybe this is a weird me thing. I think it's really satisfying to fill out a form because there's like a right place for everything. And especially when there's like magic in the form where like it does stuff. And so. For me, this was obvious. Like, it's a form. So. Wow. 
And and is this is is there? I I love this. So is there? Is there also like a spreadsheet somewhere or is this it? This so, stack of papers is your process. So this is, yeah, so it starts with this. Eventually this yeah. will turn into a spreadsheet of all the puzzles that uh, like makes some code that can be copied into the game that just so we can keep them in order, yeah. like for real, like the actual thing that gets like shipped. Um, and then each one of these, so we're weird also, we, um, so the so Keith and I kind of like started Zactronics, like all of the technical direction comes from us. All of our puzzles are implemented with code because like I'm a programmer and I'm the designer and I can write code. So most of our games don't have level editors. There's just like a place where you create like a, an instance of an object for each puzzle. And just like, we, we have like these huge, like I just, our new game, I think it's like 5,000 lines of code for all the puzzles. Visual Studio hates me and will no longer, if I edit that file, it will no longer allow me to type things without waiting like three seconds after each keyword. Yeah. <laughs> but it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and so so these I basically like, I, I workshop the whole game and try to like balance it in my head. I guess that's another weird Zactronics thing is that I don't. Some people design puzzles by like coming up with a solution, and then they're like, oh well, here's the solution to this puzzle. Now I'm going to erase half of it and make that the puzzle. That is bullshit. Don't do that. Huh. Um, so I, I guess you could. That's how everybody else does it. Uh, so the the way that um, that I make puzzles is I just kind of come up with a challenge and just like, yeah, this is probably doable, right? Okay. Like we made tools that would probably allow something like this to be solvable, and so it probably is. And for the most part, if I had designed the tools, I can kind of look at this and be like, oh yeah, like this should be solvable. That's probably harder than that one, so I think I need to swap it. And then like at some point they'll actually go into the game and get play tested and then move around more. Mm -hmm. But like I can do a lot of that like in my head in advance with paper. But but you don't play it through and 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 then and like and confirm that it's solvable so or, or uh, confirm that it's like interesting or fun or okay, you just are like, no, <laughs> this, is a, this is a challenge, this should be doable, I'm gonna put it in the game. So one, you can't test it until it's programmed. Yeah. And so that actually pushes that way far out, yeah. right? Two, you can't like, it, I guess you, I can kind of solve these puzzles, but like by the time that I get to it, like I've already solved it in my head. And like yeah. I, I, like a lot of our games are about programming, and I'm good at programming, I guess. So I can like picture in my head like what is and isn't possible. Like I, there's a lot going on up here, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the third thing is that um, it's up to other people to tell me if it's fun. <laughs> right. And so it's sort of like at some point we just have to like commit it to code and do it. I, I think of your games as being um, an example of a of a thing that happened in indie games where there was kind of the, the return of the puzzle. Um, I think for, you know what I mean? Like for <laughs> if a while, only I, I made a puzzle platformer, I'd yeah. be a fucking millionaire, right? Like, yeah, but, <laughs> but there was a, like. Black the, and white the, graphics. The, like, but the return of the classic authored puzzle, right? Oh. So I'm thinking of things like um, Steven Sausage Roll and, yeah. and, uh, and The Witness. Yeah. You know, the idea that, that puzzles, um, could you know were were like really interesting again, and people were like really getting deep into them, and and um, I, I think of your games, but but do you when, when I don't know, there's a difference. I don't know the way you're describing the way you you solve puzzles. Do you have like a principle behind pu your puzzle design, or is it really more just like? these are challenges that seem like they would be interesting and you put them in. Because there's this idea, like some people talk about kind of like forward puzzle design where, where you are um, thinking about uh, you know the, the the materials and the and the rules that you've that you've created, and then how to extrapolate you know the, their interaction and their combination, and then how to illustrate that in a, with a challenge. That's really or, complicated. Yeah, or do you just <laughs> is, it, is it more intuitive and is it? Yeah, like, I mean it's the, so the the kinds of puzzle games I make are like a very small subset of all the possible things that you could call a puzzle, and even within things that are puzzles like these are like still a small subset. Like I've tried designing logic puzzles, like like a set of rules that comes out with like a Sudoku kind of rule set. Yeah. They're really hard. Like yeah. that's a very different kind of thing because those are puzzles that need to have like you need to be able to solve them incrementally and like using deduction right. and like certain like it's it's hard. Like that's not what these are, right? These are sort of like holistic challenges where there are so many possible ways to get there that you don't have to do any of that work. Yeah. It's just like like it's real weird. life. They're real life challenges, right? Like the more right? you describe like, it, it's almost more like physics in a way. It's yeah. almost more like you're like you're you're you you're designing this little world. You're making this little world that's clearly made up of these discrete elements that are logical <laughs> yeah, yeah. and symbolic, 
and yet they are so richly combinatory that it's almost like you can then be like, okay, now throw this ball through this hoop. Yeah. It's, Except it's, the ball is just a certain kind of output, and the hoop is just like a certain set of circuits. Yeah, yeah. I, I think they're, they are very similar to physics puzzles, except that they're deterministic yeah. and discrete, which is super important. I, right? I'm like pretty all sure of physics our, is both of those things. Well, I, <laughs> it, it, physics game, physics engines are not right. Physics yeah. engines are all about shit flying off the rails. Yeah. So, like every, I mean, I guess it's kind of like a joke at Zachtronics. Every single game we've made takes place on a grid. Opus Magnum is special yeah. in that it takes place on a hex grid. Yeah. <laughs> And we're going back to square grids, right? And it's like yeah. that every single one takes place on a square grid, and there's well, a grid. And there's a reason for that, right? Is because that's what enables it to be that you can predict exactly what'll happen, right? Like in an Infinimine or Infinifactory is a 3D grid, but it's still a grid. And like if you tried to make that game without like a grid, it would be insane. And right. so we like the physics in that game are a special kind of physics like rule set that we designed to work on a grid to yeah. work deterministically. But even yeah. then it's kind of dodgy sometimes. Yeah. So this, um, what this is, is this, uh, this is worksheet a, from? This is an Infinifactory puzzle. Oh. So there's like a sketch on the top part that looks nothing. So the way we actually, so I, I cannot design, so I, I'm good at designing puzzles, maybe. I cannot design like a space. I have no architectural space. Like I'm in awe of like, like Brendan, uh, who does like the Blendo games, because mm. he can design spaces and levels and that, he just like thinks that way. And there's lots yeah. of people who design levels and get it. I, I don't visualize spaces. It's amazing, I don't get lost, I guess. Um, like, so when we do, um, like when we did Infinifactory, I came up with these puzzles. I came up with the products and like what the inputs and outputs would be. And then I just sort of said to our artist, Kyle, I'm like, here's our engine, go make some islands and I'll fit the puzzle into it. And yeah. I actually like doing that because I, same thing with the boards. All yeah. the boards in Shenzhen were designed by Kyle to be aesthetically pleasing yeah. and like weird. And then I like picked and chose between them about like which, pro which puzzles would be jammed into that. Because right. it's like real life, right? right? Like when you're the person making a color changing vape pen, you don't get to choose like what size the circuit board is necessarily, right? right. Like maybe there's product demands coming in that say it has to be like this big. It has to fit in this dumb package that our industrial designers came up with, yeah. Yeah. you know? And I think it makes our puzzles better and more emergent and more like real life problem solved. Yeah. You're just being confronted with this problem that does not care fundamentally if you can solve it or not. Yeah. Hopefully it is. Space Chem, I never beat the last level in Space Chem because I didn't have the I just didn't have the stomach to play it. Who's got the time? Yeah, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Some people, it turns out. You've got games to 2% <laughs> of Space Spacechem players. <laughs> um Yeah. Uh what was I gonna say? <laughs> uh I wanna ask about uh, oh yeah, there's a weird relationship between your games and work. Oh yeah. Uh, have you thought about this? A lot, yeah. yeah. Tell us your thoughts about this. Is this, a, uh, this is worksheet for... Oh yeah, well, for we can, we can turn the projector. You wanna sit back down after Yeah, this? well why don't we leave the projector on okay. and then just like raise the lights. Is that a combination that we could do? Oh, fantastic. So here, uh, that here. way we could go back to this if we want. So um, Opus Magnum puzzles are substantially easier to design. You just come up with some bullshit molecules and then you're done. Um, <laughs> Wow. But, but even, obviously, I, I'm kind of kidding. Um, they, they really were easy to make. This is why I think Opus Magnum has a much more successful uh, level creation community mm -hmm. because it's just so much easier to make the levels. Yeah. Designing a, a, I guess this is kind of ironic, designing a Shenzhen I.O. level requires writing Lua. Because the okay. only way to script like those test cases is to write a program that generates it, but then like the game is too constrained to be the programming language in which you create the puzzles. Yeah. And so you have to use an external programming language. Yeah. And I'm lazy, and I don't really want to enable people that much to make their own levels because they're going to be bad. And so we're like, well, yeah. Lua, that's a good compromise. Yeah. Did you know that indexes in Lua start at one? Like in an array? <laughs> what the? It was designed by like a petroleum company because they're just like, well, we'll make our own programming language. Oh, it's insane, annoying. but yeah. that was what we gave people. Yeah. So, yeah, it makes uh, TIS assembly look good by comparison, yeah. I guess. It's, that's the joke we make is that Lua is also an esoteric programming game. Yeah. Programmer <laughs> jokes. So, um, so this is a, a puzzle for Opus Magnum. And like, it's really simple, right? There's a molecule, there, there's a repeating molecule on the right, there's an input molecule on the left. But like, this is me working out in my head, like if there's only a single uh, atom input, that means that you have to reuse it for the other two side pieces. And then the other two side pieces are the same, so maybe you can like build a common machine that turns that, uh, whatever that is, that's earth, into, um, into salt. And, uh, and so like, already okay, in my so head, I can visualize what a solution requires like this and yeah. how hard it's gonna be. But this is different, for, a little bit different from what you, no, is this the kind of thing that you might 
uh, stumble across while you're solving a different puzzle and then think, oh, this should be its own puzzle. You're like, oh, here's an interesting thing that I, that I discovered. And no, you're really just saying you just this you just picture this. Like a very small percentage of our yeah. puzzles are ones where we came up with the idea and then like later I go back and make, like I discover something while playing it. Usually I'll just make a bunch of stuff and we'll just push it out the door yeah. and then like, We'll see what happens. Okay. So I love it. Yeah, um, I, I feel bad right. about that. No, I, no, I do. But I feel like I, I feel like if we spent more time and kind of like went to like like played the game and like incorporated that back, we'd probably get better stuff. But I like don't know. this comes I from a place know. of laziness. Like fucking ship it, I right? Know, like two, okay. So I'm gonna say two things about that, and I'm I'll probably get in trouble from this. But <laughs> I, as a person who like teaches game design, um, I'm very skeptical of of design. Uh, in, in some ways, right? Like I and 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 not not I, be, I believe in the process of design and, and I believe in 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 the importance of like thinking about what you're doing. But this idea that we have you know best practices that um, we can apply um, to to like help predict what is you know or explain what's good. Um, it just seems so often to not be the case, right? So often, like, there, there, we do have all of these elaborate theories about how to produce, you know, great puzzles, and um, and yet uh, often great puzzles can just come out of uh, a, a totally different process, like like what you're describing. <clears throat> and um, you know, I just think it's the the important thing is the other thing about what you said about it, you, you're embarrassed because it comes from a place of laziness. I mean, I also think that 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 laziness is the great engine of productivity. I'm not that uh, ashamed. It, it really <laughs> is. Like it's in it's it's the corner cutting yeah. uh, that we do to avoid work that that produces all of civilization, right? <laughs> uh, I, and, and, and I often, again, I, I, I tell my students, this is probably bad advice, because uh, I just got through saying all advice is bad. So this is an example of bad advice, uh, it is when you make it easy on yourself as the designer, you're often making it easier on the player. Um, like doing it the easy way, when you think, how can I simplify this? How can I make this less complicated? What's the simplest, most obvious solution? Um, is obvious, like you're, you're often, that's the position the player is in. They're yeah. just, they're confused, they're distracted, they've got other more important things to do. And by, by, by finding, by sort of cutting through the complexity and finding the sort of simple thing, uh, you're actually, uh, you're, you're giving them a, a, a main line to what the game is actually about, yeah. right? The heart of what the game is about. Um, so that was a, a wonderful uh, whirlwind tour through, through some of your sketches. I, um, you, I wanna go back, one of the things you talked about was the, this lovely, lightweight world building that you do, which I think is uh, amazing. I really like it. It's always been there. Uh, even at the very beginning, the, the things you, uh, in your very earliest games, the, yeah. the weird names, uh, the things you called things, um, and it's, it's so wafer thin. Um, it, it's so much, like, it's so obvious that it's not meant to be heavy and it's not meant to be the main idea of the game. Uh, and yet it actually does quite a bit to kind of communicate a weirdness and, a, and, a, and a, like, there's often something a little bit sad or a little bit tragic about these worlds, Always? these worlds made of engineering, <laughs> yeah, worlds definitely. made of circuits. And there's uh, something like a little bit, dystopic, you know, and in some cases, like, really obviously so, like, in, in, you know, in Fit a Factory, um, but in some cases, just, just like, in a lightweight, uh, there's just kind of melancholy. Uh, wh where, where is that coming from? That's real life, man. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, my, my wife's out there somewhere in the audience, so she wrote a bunch of our stories, and um, so Space Chem, she started writing the Space Chem story, and I think I imagined something that was more boring. And then she came out with this thing that was like filled with, or I guess I, I had the high, okay, now here's how it probably went. So, um, so I was, I came up with all these just ideas with no substance. I'm like, oh, wouldn't it be great if it was like cosmic horror? Cosmic horror is cool. But like, I didn't do any of the work. And she comes back with a story that's like cosmic horror, like, like people are like, somebody's like head explodes and then like a piece of the nostril lands on the narrator. And it's like, holy shit, I couldn't write stuff that good if I tried, right? And it's so I, I, I think like I, we kind of like relished in like that kind of aspect of it. Like so, so space chem, everybody dies, um, and in like a pretty dramatic ways. Um, in Ironclad Tactics, the main character like goes on like is like the heroic main character goes on this like folly of an adventure and ends up getting radiation sickness from alternate history robots. Um, 
and nearly dies. In Infinifactory, everybody that you find in all their audio logs are failure logs. And so every person you come across in Infinifactory, for the most part, is dead. And you find out that. And so that one specifically is a metaphor for how people drop off like flies playing our games. Mm. That like, it's <laughs> really? a different, yeah. Oh, that's good. Like the, that's good. The tutorial, yeah. when you finish the tutorial, there's like a little room and there's two doors. And there's a little thing that's like deciding which door you go in. And it puts you in the left door. And then you walk through it. And then there's a big window. So you can like, when you walk down this hallway, you can look out and see that the right door just led right out into space and there's just dead bodies floating out there and it's like yeah a lot of people don't make it through our tutorials you know so yeah I, I don't know I think we just kind of like it I think there's there's some truth in it and it's also fun like that's it's a coping mechanism maybe yeah. I don't know <laughs> I don't know in my mind I had sort of built it out into kind of like a, a weird worldview based in like your kind of like deep dive into the the, the logic of of engineering Right? Like, in some ways, your games are about the Enlightenment. Do you know what I mean? Like, they're rooted in, like, David Hume and Adam Smith and, and the Scottish Enlightenment and people like, just like, and like not the scientific revolution, but, but, the, but the industrial revolution. Like, the, the real important, like, historical change happened because of engineers uh, and inventors figuring out how to make machines better. And then the scientists sort of caught up. You know, and I, so, so to me, this is the world that your that your games take place in, um, and and it's not it, like it's a lovely world. It's a beautiful, it's a hypnotically addictive and entertaining world, um, but it's also like sometimes a scary world and a lonely world. So you our, know? our usual template for a story, like we, I think the one thing we do in a lot of our stories is we tell game, we tell stories about engineers, and so we don't try to make them heroes. We make them engineers. Like engineers are not necessarily heroic people. They're not. They don't even. A lot of times they don't even know what they're doing. Right? They're they're driven forward by this need to yeah. create stuff and to optimize it. Like in spite of everything. Yeah. Right? And it's just it's just a force of nature, yeah. right? And I and I think that we try to capture that and reflect that. Like Shenzhen is filled with stuff. Like you, the person, the, the main character goes to Shenzhen because they need a job because they don't make things here anymore, right? Like that's how the story starts. And like that, we just tried to tell an honest story about an engineer. And it's like it turns out engineers don't care about necessarily being heroes. You don't necessarily get the opportunity to do something amazing. You don't necessarily get to change the world. You just get to work on stuff. But that's like that's fun in itself. Like my view of like so so human resource machine has this sort of like bleak take. Like like it's much more on. Like, on the nose about what you're describing, yeah. right? That like industrialization and automation, you know, like turns people into robots and blah, 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 like yeah. stuff like that. Like, I don't hold that view, right? Yeah. Like, I think yeah. like people, like, like to engineer is human, right? Like yeah. we build stuff and like we need to work, like when we stop working, we die. Yeah. And, and like that's, that's part, I mean, that's, I guess like Protestant work ethic working its way into my worldview. But like for me, like working is my life. Like it's yeah. a big part of it. And like, that's, that's like a, you know, like that, that's that's a that's a thing. Yeah, no, it's important that, that it's not it's not dystopic, right? Well, they, is, some of them very much are. <laughs> yeah, but but there's there, there's there's also beauty, right? Yeah. And it's and it's not this 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 heavy handed like story about. No. Um, and, and there is there's comfort and beauty. like like we were talking about the relationship of your games to work and and um, you clearly love to work and you get so much out of it. Um, I in uh, recently in 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 working on a game, I was struggling with a lot of these heavy game design problems that I couldn't solve, and and I would turn to the programming part as like a comfort. You know what I mean? Like that is a place, and I'm terrible. Like I'm a terrible programmer, but there was a kind of like well, you know with the programming task that it's solvable. Yeah. Like anything you can think of, you can do with a computer. And so if you just keep plugging away at it, you will make progress. Yeah. It's not true with design. No. So <laughs> so do you um like do you in, like do you enjoy the technical side of what you do, the design side of what you do? Are they both they, you go back and forth or what? The design side is definitely what motivates me. Yeah. Like the the reason I this is something I think a lot about like why do I create my games, right? Sometimes I think it's because I want to be successful or make be famous or whatever and that always leads me to like bad places right like that's not this is something i've like wrestled with a lot mm. over the years and the conclusion i've come to recently is that the only like like the the only reason i can make games is if like i want to right and like the day that it stops being about me as selfish as that is is like the day i have to stop yeah. cuz like you can't you can't make stuff for other people like like that's we've tried to do that in the past we've tried to make a game that like we'd thought would be you know, popular and it backfired because like yeah. that's not where greatness comes from, right? You just have to like try to do the thing you want to do and try to get away with it for as long as possible. Yeah, which like, is <laughs> it's funny because you're you're an engineer who has broken loose and is creating tasks for himself. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. like yeah. like instead oh, of like kind of being told up. what to do. <laughs> yeah, and and in the result, you're making games which yeah. are tasks 
cut loose yeah. from any yeah. productivity. Like yeah. they're tasks that have no purpose. The, the games we make are idealized programming environments that yeah are just like <laughs> like like programming programmer Valhalla. Yeah, right? like, it is fighting the, the perfect battle forever. Yeah, like, yeah, it is quite beautiful. Um, I want to ask you about the business side of what you do. Okay. So so you you made. Space Chem, yes. and it was a, a big success, and you started, and you, you gathered big together success. some other people. It was a nice success. <laughs> and you thought, oh, I can make a living making these games. Yeah. And so then you um, put together a team, and you started making games, and, and you've kind of ridden through the ups and downs of, of the indie the game indie world you know, <laughs> development scene. So what's your view on that? Are things, because people, um, you know, are concerned about the, the there's, a, there's a lot more games now. There's like, a, I think, a thousand games a minute being released on Steam, something like this. And uh, do you look at that environment? Does it, does it worry you? Do you feel like it's, it hasn't changed that much? Or what's your perspective? So I, I think that's why the thing I was talking about, doing it for myself, right? Because yeah. if you look at that, it is scary, right? Like, nobody should be playing my games. They're, like, weird and terrible, right? And, it's, and, and so... I, I think if you look at stuff like that and you, you focus too much on trying to make money, like it gets really hard to, to play that game. And so like we make games and then we sell them and then we get lucky. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of stuff you can do to do better in that space, right? Like the gift, like so, so Opus Magnum, its greatest feature in Opus Magnum is that it makes GIFs of your solutions. And GIFs loop endlessly and so do factories, right? And they work right. And, and so um, we have this feature where after you beat a level, you push a button and it drops a GIF on your desktop that you can upload straight to Twitter and people do. And it's been great. Right, and people share the game, and everybody's like, "What the fuck is that? That is awesome!" And they like they check out the game because of it. It says Opus Magnum right at the top of the tw the, the GIF. It's in this little like metal frame that's tooled by Kyle, and uh, and that was a cool like that's a cool thing to do, right? Yeah. And I think that a lot. I mean, I try not to give advice to indies because like you were talking something about advice being like all advice is terrible. Yeah. Like I, this is why I didn't want to give a talk because I don't want to try to tell you guys what to do because it's not going to apply. Um, but one thing you can do, uh, to break my rule, is like make a game that, like you, you can't, you can't like, just advertise your game after the fact and like hope to have be successful because of that. Like a lot of I'm on like indie mailing lists and stuff, and a lot of indies like they they talk about like marketing and they're like, oh, you got to market it, you got to do all these things, you got to get out there with streamers. And it's like if you make a cool game, people will play it. Like that's kind of the premise, right? Like yeah. streamers are like not like if, there's some like thing on like a thread about like. Like, how much should you pay, like, a YouTube person to play your game? And they were like, oh, like, the Yogscast people, like, I don't know, like, they're, like you pay people money to play your game and, like, debating whether or not it's worth it. And it's just, like, just make a game and just, like, put it out there. And, like, if it's good, people will play it. Yeah. And if it's not good, don't obsess over trying to make it better by, like, chasing after Steam reviews or, like, going in and, like, every time somebody leaves a negative Steam review, trying to convince them to change it to a positive because your game is really worth it. It's like, no, just move on. Like, make a better game, try again. Like, we made Space Camp, it did really well. We were, like, shocked by how well it did. We made Ironclad Tactics, and no one liked it. And we were, like, devastated by it. And the only way to fix that was to make Infinifactory and yeah. make another game, yeah. right? And, like, yeah. that's... That's the only thing you can do as a game designer is make games. I guess technically you can try to like tweak it and like do stuff at the periphery and try to be clever with your businesses, but it's just like just make games. That's my that's my thing. Yeah. It might not work for everybody. I don't know. No, there are there are different approaches and and I really admire and, and respect the people like I mean there's like a, there's a guy named uh, Ryan Clark and and uh, he's a, a Canadian developer uh, the uh, Crypt of the Nectar Dancer and he does oh. these amazing kind of deep dives every week he goes through the Steam uh, release list and he talks about what's coming up and his attitude is like listen I I'm going to spend a year on this game. Like I need it to. I need to maximize its chance of success. Um, but uh, then on the other side, do you have what what you're talking about, which is this idea of like, you 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 really can't know. You can't predict. What you have control over is your ability to produce. And you the the more that you make, um, the more chances you have to to like get something out in the world that connects with people. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's confusing. Yeah, I think there's a lot of bad science. Like, people do these things, then yeah. they succeed, and then it looks scientific. But, like, you didn't actually, like, run a control group and, like, see, right. like, it's not really <laughs> yes. science. Like, right. 
And then there's also like this idea of like looking under the streetlight for your keys. Like you didn't drop them under the streetlight, <laughs> but it's so much easier to see under the streetlight. So like paying a streamer is something you can do, right? Like making a good game that people like it is just not a thing that you can like yeah. guarantee. Like no. whereas like paying a streamer is a thing. Oh, I can check that off of a list. That's yeah. a thing I can do. Whereas this other thing is is always going to be a little bit more of a shot in the dark. Or, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so we don't do any PR for our games. Like the is that game, true? the game is the PR. We I, I spent like a hundred dollars on Facebook ads once. I was like, this was a waste of money, and then never again. Yeah, wow. We send out keys, I guess, to people. I don't even like sending everybody who emails me. If anybody emails me asking for a key, they are not who they say they are because nobody wants to play a fucking Zachtronics game. <laughs> nobody wants to stream a Zachtronics game. So like, if they do, I know them because like we're <laughs> friends on the internet now because they liked my games. You right, know, like right. it's they're so. Ugh. Um, it's a scam. So, so talk about the decision to sell your company and uh, and like give up being your own boss. What was the thinking behind that, and are you happy that you made that change? I mean, so, I, I, at that point, I'd actually already given up being my own boss because I went to work at Valve. Right. Okay. And right. So that made it easy. <laughs> so was, this was about returning, but under a new structure. Yeah. yeah. I, I was really dying to make. So the the thing like Valve makes good games that take a lot of time and a lot of people and like Valve makes games in the scheme of things <laughs> from a historic perspective. Oh, that's right. You know, yeah. Possibly into the future, though we can't. No, like in general, Valve makes good games and they make them by putting a lot of people on them for a lot of times and then throwing out the stuff that sucks, yeah. right? And that is one way to be successful. Like, I don't want to make good games necessarily. I just want to make a lot of them right. because that's the part that feels good to me. Like making right. a game, but then like not releasing it is not why I make games, right? I make games to, to get them out there, even if they're bad, even if they're like really quick and dirty, or there's like huge problems with them, even if they're not huge hits. Like, I, I don't need that, right? Like, I just want to make games and put them out there. And so for me, I, I felt that I'd be better off making games, like back at something like Zytronics. The one thing I also didn't want to do was run a business. Right. Running a business is not the same as making games. They are two different activities, and being good at one does not make you good at the other. Um, and if you're going to run a studio and design the games, you have to do both well. And so I was more than happy. Like, I, it was just sort of dumb luck that we found this company that was willing to buy us and, and fund our game development efforts with minimum interference. They're amazing. It's That's seriously, great. and it's I, worked out well. Oh my god, yeah. it's amazing! Yeah, I like. I, I have zero desire to go back to, to what was happening before. There's uh, just no reason, right? Another, like another thing you did uh, uh, was when you were uh, ha when you had your company was doing work for hire, and <laughs> and that was a, in that sense you're very much like a New York style game designer um, because we New York has never had like a big mainstream game industry presence, and if you um, grew up in New York City and you want to be a game designer, you had to like put together a career that involved things very much like yeah. what you did. You would go work, you know, for Microsoft. You would go, you'd be, uh, you know, do interface design for something that wasn't a game, or you do multimedia design, you do this or you do that, and then you do game design when you could, and you would do work for hire occasionally. Yeah. And um, and so, like, that seems to have been also a good process for you. Like, did you, did that bother yeah. you to, like, have to do a game within the context of someone else's vision or someone else's so goal? The, the only reason we did it is because they gave us pretty much full creative control, and I, at that time, I thought I wanted to make educational games, which I later learned was a joke. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a fan of educational games anymore. <laughs> okay. uh, I much prefer making fake things that feel like they're educational, because um, yeah. you get to design it. Like that's there's too many there's too many things holding you back when you make actual educational games. And maybe like this thing that we think is education isn't even like a thing that you need to be doing. I, I don't know. It's, that's the thing I haven't figured out yet. It's complicated. Turns out it's a can of worms. And so I started like digging into that. So by the time we got to the third educational game, I was having like a really serious like crisis of conscience about what we were doing. It, just didn't, it didn't feel good. Um, <laughs> and, um, and in general, I, I kind of think like doing work for hire is a trap. Right, you get just enough money to like get right back to where you were beforehand, yeah. and so it puts food on the table, which is good. But like, it doesn't really help advance like big strategic goals. And so, like, like you know, doing work for hire kept us like afloat. We were, I mean, we were we were not paying ourselves a lot when we were making Ironclad Tactics and doing the educational work. So like, we had enough buffer to also spend that money to make Ironclad Tactics. But like, it didn't do that well. And so like, like. It kept us alive a little longer, but it was the stuff that came after that really like kept us going. Interesting. Um, what do you? Uh, what What is uh, some of the inspiration that feeds into your work? I mean, do you play a lot of games? Are there? Are is there music, m film, uh, books, uh, TV shows? Anything that that you draw inspiration from? Uh, that's a good question. Not, so I don't play a lot of games anymore. I'm going to admit, I don't, I don't really like games that much anymore, but I love making games, so that's a weird situation to be in. Um, 
I don't, oh God, it's just like, it used to be that I was really inspired by reading books, but then that just pushed me to like, do like dumb cinematic stuff that didn't like, wasn't cost effective. Really? So I'm like, we're like obsessed. I guess I'm like obsessive about making cost effective games that like, if we're making, if we're making assets and it's not like directly helping the mechanical, like people play our games in mechanics. Yeah. And so if we spend time making resources that aren't going to help make that part of the game better, it's probably not a good use of our time. Yeah. Right. And like, so part of this, this is something that like Keith is more of this than me. And so sort of like pushed me in this direction more, I think, but like, I think that's how we stayed alive. Live. Like when we when we were in that period after Ironclad Tactics, like we learned a lot of like good and bad survival tricks that like really profoundly affected how we make decisions as a studio. And one of them is that we're sort of relentless um, at trying to keep like resource costs down and doing right. stuff like that. So all the things I learned from books, I'm like, oh my god, it would be so cool. I just read like this great Neil Stevenson novel. Wouldn't it be great if it was this huge cinematic thing? And it's like, no, it would not be great. Like we're good at making mechanics. Um, I think the most inspiring thing in the past has probably been like reading like nonfiction like Wikipedia articles. About right? what? Like integrated circuits or stuff. So my, my, my technique is that I'll read an article about something or I'll look at something, but then I'll misunderstand it into like a version that works in my head. Like Constructor was that integrated circuit game was made by looking at like pictures of integrated circuits, but like not actually wanting to dig into it ah. enough to learn about it because like I'm not that good with electronics. Um, they're, they're complicated, it turns out. Like real life sucks because like electronics yeah. is hard, but yeah. I can make a game like Shinjin I.O. or Constructor where electronics is less hard, still hard, but like less hard. Like I did a bunch of embedded electronics and it sucks. Like yeah. your stuff is always breaking. It's not doing what you want. Like you have to put capacitors on stuff because like the power supply is like not good and like it doesn't want to work, you know? And like there's all this stuff that you can't see it and it's not working, but computers are magical because you know exactly what it's doing most of the time. Do it's you are you interested in like contemporary like computer science and engineering and and just science in general like physics and stuff like that do you are you interested in AI is it possible you would ever do a game about like machine learning or or There's these no new kind of that, AI techniques I don't think so like all the but what about a Zactronics game about but, machine learning well, I mean, think okay, about so it maybe like all of my yeah. we, we, we looked I briefly looked into doing a game about like quantum mechanics and I, yeah. I, I solicited our fans I'm like please somebody help like explain quantum mechanics to me in a way that will make a good Zactronics game you can't it's just math and math sucks like and so like I think that like and that's the thing with all this stuff like all of these things these people are making real life research like I, I admire the fact that they're doing real stuff but like it doesn't really help me that much because it's just too real it's too complicated like there's yeah. a reason you have to get degrees to like do this stuff for real yeah. and so I much prefer to gloss over it misunderstand it and then build like a little like version for babies yeah. like that's like like Shenzhen I.O. and stuff is like integrated circuits for babies. Like what if like microcontrollers are actually really complicated, the manuals are actually like 500 pages long and they're written by assholes who don't care if you understand it <laughs> versus people like us who love our players and want people to have a fun time reading it and understand it. And so, you know, like our data sheets are like the fun baby version of real data sheets. Yeah. And like our chips have this much code in it instead of like so much that I can't yeah. show you with my hands. Yeah. It's yeah. fun, like that's what makes it fun. Like throwing stuff away makes it fun. Yeah. Um, I'm going to open it up to the audience for Q&A. Yeah. Um, so you talked about how your puzzle design is very top down. You kind of like, you have these systems and then you just like write out a worksheet and then you program it in and then you're like, okay, that's that. I'll deal with it later. Uh, and it seems, and you, you talked about how you don't even worry about it if they're possible or not. But uh, historically, you, it seems like you have not come into designing a puzzle and then later realizing that it's impossible and having to remove it unless that has happened, then could you talk about that? And also, it seems like the reason why that's not every puzzle is because you design robust systems from the outset where you can sort of contextualize puzzles that might be possible and might be interesting challenges. How, does, how do you think you come to these systems? Are they like inspired by real life systems like yours were just talking about, or are they just do you come up with them the same way you come up with the puzzles where like, oh, I have this idea for robust mechanics. I'm just going to put those in and see what happens. Uh, okay, so to answer your first question, I, I do design impossible puzzles. The famous one is that in Infinifactory, I made a puzzle that my wife spent, she did like Vanguard playtesting on Infinifactory, which is the people who figure out if it's actually solvable. She spent at least eight hours on a puzzle before we realized it was like physically impossible. Like there was just no way to weld it together in that shape. So yeah, she's a champ. Yeah, so it does happen. Uh, you just don't, yeah, unless, until you come work for us, you won't have to experience it. Uh, uh, yeah, that's Vanguard. So we have a thing like Vanguard playtesting. It's always important to get at least one person to like legitimately play through your game before you ship it. Otherwise it might not be possible. <laughs> but, what you, but what you don't do 
is the thing that we teach as a best practice, which is iterative uh, design, right? You there, don't do a lot of like, oh, first I'll do a, a lightweight version of this and then I'll play through it and then I'll oh, tweak yeah. it and play through it and tweak it and play through we, it. We are iterative, but like there's no like like baby version. Like there's no, pro we tried prototyping with like Ironclad Tactics and look where that got us, yeah. right? Yeah. Like I, it's, there's a special, I think that, it depends on what kind of game we make. And I think that in general, I think of myself as like a weak game designer because I, you can't just throw me into any game studio and have me do good stuff, right? Like I don't think I could ever work at Blizzard, not that I would necessarily want to, but just like I, I don't think I'd be useful there, right? Yeah. Like, but there's a thing that I do that I am good at because like I can take a bunch of, like I can just take a lot of leaps, yeah. right? Like I understand. So all of the, um, like those electronics games kind of fundamentally come from like in, in college I took like a computer theory class like computability and like it sort of like that was sort of the thing that kicked off like this idea of like oh like computation isn't just like code into Visual Studio like computation is like a like a physical like there's something in it's reality like it's like a machine it's like a machine yeah. but there's like a like computer science exists without computers yeah which is crazy yeah. and like there's like a logic to it and there's like there's an idea of like systems that compute things and like kind of grasping that intuitively or just like resonating having it resonate with me like right. that that allows me to take these leaps and just sort of be like yeah this is probably doable um it's in a way it's like your your earlier games were like prototypes i yes. mean in a sense oh, yeah, like you yeah. did all these games you just release them and yeah. then later on it turns out oh yeah that was a prototype for... i never thought of them as like yeah that. so I, yeah. I i'm blessed to have been uh, started making indie games before people thought they could make money off of them yeah and so when i made games it was just like i'm gonna make a crappy game for fun and like that was the goal right, right. like it was never like i'm gonna build a crappy game in anticipation of making a better version that i can sell in the app store and become a millionaire yeah, like so there's, that was never even like something that an influenced like this, me this, this large-scale iterative loop over the course of your whole career Career, yeah. rather than on each individual yeah, game. Yeah, definitely. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm blinded by the light, but yeah. is there a hand right over there? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, pick the best one. <laughs> Oh, that was oh. like uh, in like Infiniminer, like the, the Compet yeah, the competitive the com games are the ones that did the worst. Yeah, is that kind of what you're getting at, in a sense? Yeah. <laughs> so Ironclad Tactics and Infinifrag, which are the most directly competitive games, yeah. are also the ones that are maybe the black sheep of yeah, the yeah. Zachronic. So thing. I think uh, about it. Yeah, <laughs> I played a lot of TF2. At like a lot of TF2. What do you play? I would say, Which, what do you? What oh, is I your like main engineer. engineer. I don't play anymore. They, they've, it's not. It's not the same. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Engineer. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I, 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 I played a lot of that game. And so when I went to make a game, like I, oh, I've, I've talked about this before. Like, so I, I really much like I started as like a lay game designer. And so like the way that normal people who have no training making games is they're just like, I saw that in a game I liked. I'm going to try to imitate that. Yeah. And. The only thing I've ever made that wasn't basically that were like space chem and stuff, yeah. right? Because that wasn't me imitating anything. That was just like an original idea that happened to be good. I, I think it's sort of just like those games weren't good because they're just not good. And the there have been experiments that were better. And like following those and iterating on those, I've iterated way more on my non-competitive games. Um, and it just worked. It started off better and then it continued to get even better. So just like dumb luck. Like that's why I said I don't think I'm a good general game designer, and that's okay. Because I got a yeah, thing. Apparently, you don't need to be yeah, to make exactly. hit games and work at Valve. So yeah. why, why should we care? I think <laughs> yeah. they overestimated my abilities. Um, yes. Hi. I was wondering when you were younger, you really liked virtual mixed reality and uh, laser tag. Why less so now when they're more obtainable than ever? Oh, because I, I got time. I got to spend time with it, and I realized I didn't like it. So this is a, que <laughs> the, the this dream. Is a question about VR and like real world, uh, oh, yeah. like VR and AR games. Like, why aren't yeah. you doing them now? I, I think it's. The, the dream of being able to do something like that was what motivated me. Uh, the thing that really motivates me with all my games is sort of like I can picture in my head like, wouldn't it be great if, and then I like have to do the work to make it a reality. That was one that I never really like made it happen. I didn't go Palmer Lucky on that problem. Cell phones, like smartphones weren't a thing then. So it just didn't happen. And yeah, now that it's available, I, it was exciting to work at Valve on VR. I worked on the lab. I, I programmed the Zortex game in the lab, which is like the first like bullet hell shooter in VR maybe. And um, and so that was fun, and then I was pretty much over it after that. I, was, I, I'm, I don't have, a, I'm not very bullish on VR anymore. Like wow. the opposite. Wow. I'm not a VR fan. Yeah, but like, you, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I, I think it's, it's kind of, I don't have to go off about VR. Well, 
Give us a little bit. Give oh, us okay. A mini rant. You, you, because I think it's, it's weird, and people um, like it's what you're describing is uh, uh, very common within the game industry. People are like, yeah, no, VR is kind of a, a swing and a miss. Yeah. And maybe five years, so not even not even the next generation, but maybe the generation after that, we'll revisit it as a possibility. <laughs> but outside of games, there's still this like weird bubble of of excitement and yeah. hype. And uh, wh- like, why the discrepancy? What do the, you think? The Connect Four is going to be the best Connect. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's not a gimmick, man. Yeah, I don't know. I just there's like, I, I so I was like I was a really big fan of the Vive. Like I went to work at Valve basically because of the Vive. Like I thought it was the coolest thing. Um, the controllers, like this was when Oculus was still like, oh, you'll just walk around with a D pad, yeah. and it's like, no, you're not. Like that's not cool. And then they were like, oh, we have motion track controls. I was like, holy shit! Like as a game designer, that's what I want. Yeah. And I thought it was cool. But even then, it turns out like it's actually kind of constraining. I can do so much more with a mouse and a keyboard in such a more direct, like easy, accessible, not physically painful like way and it's like cheaper and like it's like why would you make a VR game yeah I I guess it's more Um, immersive but like uh, I just want to make sure that I'm not leaving out anyone in the back but yes right right here and then add one more note like books are immersive books are and they don't require a headset like yes So the question is about the, the printed manuals in your games, uh, I guess Shenzhen IO and TIS. 100. So A, I love paperwork. That should be a thing that you guys have picked up on by now. Uh, B, um, oh God, so TIS, it was purely out of laziness. I did not want to make a tutorial for that game. And so we're just like, oh, it's software. We'll document it. <laughs> like, it was, I was honest, and it just worked, right? Like, so three, I think it's for the, the light world building thing. So you said something about the names of things in our games doing world building. And, like, that's super important. We actually, like, obsess over that. Like, in Infinifactory, all of the puzzle names are worded like they, like, worded like they would sound if they were translated from an alien language into English. Nice. So they're kind of stilted and kind of awkward. Um, and like it in, really works. In, what, whatever your process is for that, and the people that are working on that, I just want to. I want you yeah. to know it's really powerful stuff. I really like it. Yeah, we, we've always been like, like, like our like our games are not like I, a lot of people think the game, like the story is optional in our games, but like they don't realize how much it informs like all of our decisions, right? Like the way that the puzzles are, and the way that things work, and the way that things are named. Like it all, like it has to be real. Yeah. Like there's a realness to it, and that all comes from like a story of like a world and a place and a time and yeah. people and stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, the challenges. Oh yeah, it sucks making games with manuals, but especially when. So oh god. Okay. So like the best part of doing manuals is that you can do like a couple thousand copies of special editions, like limited things that come out at launch. The difficulty of that is that like you can't change those parts of your game easily, or you have to like issue like errata that people can update. Like with a binder, it was easy. Like it's it has challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna say we have time for one more question. Do I have a hand up all the way in the back? Yes. Two more questions. Okay. So um, you mentioned in your process the top down thing, and you know, oh, just throw it out there, and hopefully it will work, and it will solve it. I, I get that, that works. I love Space Camp, especially Shenzhen, I know I thought it was amazing, um, and a few of the other games too. My question is I almost dropped, and you mentioned a lot of people, that people who didn't make it through tutorials, and I get the feeling that a, a lot of that comes from, um, so in normal puzzle games, so to speak, non engineering games, you have like, okay, there's a wall here, and you cannot make it past until we figure out wall jumping, or you have to double jump, or you have to do something. Right. Um, it, do you think there's a way, and especially about how you talk about how you love your players so much, to bring that learning in to something that's as freeform as your, as your game? So I'll see if I can repeat this question. The, the, yeah. yeah, the question is about, um, in, in many uh, quote-unquote normal puzzle games, uh, people use puzzle design at specifically to teach core concepts along the way, um, and is that something you've ever considered? And I guess it's sort of a plea to do that. So we, we've tried different things in our games. Like Opus Magnum has a more traditional tutorial. Um, like in a game like Shinjin it's really hard. Like you can't like, like we're not gonna teach you instructions one by one. That's what the 40 page manual's for, you know? <laughs> so like that's not really, that's not really a thing there. Um, it's kind of hard when your games are open-ended um, cause like there's a bunch of different ways to tackle a problem and we don't want to like, I don't want to like turn off all the features so that way you have to use like a specific one. Although we do use that in Opus Magnum to specifically teach one command, right? So it, it kind of depends on the game. Like I, 
not that consistent. Like, do, I don't... Do people make games in your games? Oh, yeah. yeah. We, we specifically design modes where people can make games inside of games. Yeah, so you, you're not a big fan of people, like, designing puzzles. You think that would probably not be that useful or interesting? Oh, they're just bad in practice. I only say yeah. that from, like, we've done a lot of experiments with yeah. that. Like, the, the TIS and, like, Shinjin IO have, like, the dodgiest puzzles. People are just like, here's an algorithm, implement it. Or, like, yeah. st- some of them are okay, but it's... But but you know. but but do you appreciate that people are making actual like games and those are the more fun ones. Those are the more fun. Like ones, we yeah. make little toys. Like so, Shinjin IO has like little like there's like an LC- you can create custom LCD screens. Like you upload a black and white image and then we convert it into it like what looks like an LCD screen with like layers and effects and stuff. Yeah. And people can make like little like crappy pocket games. Yeah. And there's like a little speaker that beeps and so somebody did like Vivaldi with yeah. like a little out of tune speaker yeah. and it was really charming and like that stuff's great. There's something Definitely. so paradoxical about your work that it is so incredibly open ended and yet is just like brutally kind of severely closed and tight and yeah, and, uh, and and at the same time you're like you're like yeah I'm not interested in like players making their own you know puzzles and yet the the process of solving puzzles in your games feels more creative than than actually designing puzzles does in many you know like yeah. games where you can design puzzles there's such a like a it's, it's it's very 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 interesting i think your work taps into like a very deep vein some like like underlying questions about about the world and about logic and about computers. Um, I have loved having this conversation. Uh, Zach Barth, you're a genius. Thank you so much for coming to the NYU Game Center. And, right? Amazing. Thank you. That was fantastic. And um, and I guess that's the, is that the end of the season? Do we do a lecture series in seasons now? Um, what's What's next, Dylan? More lectures. Do we have any names? Can we, can we billboard some of them? What's that? Mink Ed is coming. So we are having, is that the next one? No, that's not for a little while. That's not for a little while. So we're going to, this is the close of this season, but we're, we're starting a, 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 another season in, in a little bit. Mink Ed is going to be here, um, who is a brilliant escape room designer. And so we're going to learn about the process of designing escape rooms. Uh, Zach Barth, thank you so much for coming, and thanks everyone for coming to the lecture tonight. Yay. (laughs)